everyone, and thank you for coming here today, a Friday. Uh, I am Michelangelo Pantaleoni, Mickey for, for friends. <laughs> I'm an undergraduate student at the Center for Astrobiology in Madrid under the supervision of Jesus May Zapellani. And we have recently published an article with these great people here from Chile and the US in the MNRAs, where we try to centralize in a single catalog all the known OB stars, all the accessible, optically accessible OB stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So what is this talk about really? First is a talk about the history of a century of ant work to gather knowledge about the massive stellar population of the galaxy and a review of our current situation. Second is also a talk about the techniques and methods we can use in the Gaia era and about how careful we have to be when calculating distances. And finally, this is a talk about the science, the science of galactic cartography and the general properties of galactic OB population. So first, let me introduce a bit of history here. Uh, the first one to notice that massive stars were great tracers for the spiral arm structure was Morgan in his seminal work of 1953. And since that moment, uh, a race was started to discover and catalog new OB stars. A series of surveys in the North and the Southern Hemisphere was undertaken to accomplish this, which ended up with the creation of what we now call the Luminous Star Catalog, which has more than 12,000 total entries. Then Cameron Reed came along and gave us the ALS, the Alma Luminous Star Catalog, which has been the main reference for this object until now. During the 90s, he painstakingly went through hundreds of references, updating and cleaning the LS catalog star by star and merging everything into an 18,000 master list. But now we live in the Gaia era, right? And for the first time, we can systematically measure parallaxes to the required degree of precision to create a galactic map. A new race has begun with the second data release towards a full cross match of the ALS with Gaia. Automatic attempts have reached a third and two thirds of completion, meaning more careful correlations between the ALS and Gaia catalogs uh, was indeed needed. But finally, two months ago, we succeeded in this task and we have built what we now call the ALS2 in honor of Cameron, which, by the way, is, is one of the two authors. As you can see, the ALS2 has 400 entries less than the original ALS, but this is just because uh, we have discovered many duplicates in the original catalog. Now, let me get into how this was accomplished, really. We examined thousands of references in the literature. In fact, I personally analyzed more than 2,000 stars using finding charts and photographic plates uh, since Morgan's times, some trickier than others. Uh, but yeah, many stars were, were matched within minutes. So that's easy, but there are other stars that meant weeks of detective work. I want to show you a few examples like this one where an ambiguous arrow marking led to the wrong identification of the original ALS. One of the stars is in fact an OB star, but the other is not. Here we have a photographic plate uh, of an oversaturated uh, H2 region containing a few OB stars. As it turns out, the circle contains hundreds of Gaia sources and 10 of them even have similar photometry to that of the ALS counterparts we were searching for. In fact, the circle turned out to be placed in a different location and the stars were hand-drawn, making for a very, very complicated match in this case. Here we have an interesting one. Uh, a coordinate grid could, uh, could have been overimposed in this finding chart, but for some reason, it was slightly rotated. In some cases, this is fine, but not for star number five, which was confused with star number three. Again, one is an OB star, but the other is not. Sometimes uh, other things like minor typos can make for huge mistakes. In this case, this table uh, sliding one of the columns implied a difference of losing track of tens of OB stars, which now have been recovered. Many problems also uh, can arise in dense fields, like in the core of NGC 3603. In this case, the photographic plates are perfectly fine, really, but due to rounding of the decimals, the, the ALS shows a grid-like pattern in positions that is difficult to match with the true Gaia sources, as you can see. Um, by the way, these blue dots are the, the, Gaia, the Gaia sources. So here you have the, the data reduction tree. As I said, we have removed some duplicates and a few cases that were not matched with Gaia because of too low or too high brightnesses for the CCD sensor of the spacecraft. Uh, then we have filtered by astrometry and, and uh, photometric filtering. 
and we ended up with more than 15,000 OB stars with high quality counterparts in Gaia DR2. But two months have passed now, and since then, we have updated this with Gaia EDR3 data. We are now finishing building the ILS3 that we hope to publish this summer. So we have included almost 2,000 more massive stars that were missing in the ILS catalog, including some of Paul Crowder's uh, World Rider stars, the Galactic Coaster catalog, and the, well, uh, and a special survey for, for Cygnus OB2 uh, that is undertaken by Sara Rodriguez. Also, Gaia EDR3 has allowed for a 25% decrease in the uncertainties of our distance estimates, which is a huge improvement in the quality of the 3D map of the solar neighborhood, as you will see uh, soon in the animation. So the important thing here is that um, there are around 20,000 known massive stars in the galaxy, of which uh, 17.6 thousand have good quality data from Gaia now. So let me dig into how distances are, are being calculated here. We account for the zero point parallax bias in EDR3, obviously, uh, like everyone. And as you probably know, there is this problematic bias discovered by Lutz and Kalker in the 70s, which says that if we assume a normal distribution for the parallax and we try to estimate distances just by naively inverting it, we will get a skewed distribution, uh, an asymmetric bell-shaped like curve, right, for the distances. The problem here is then that the most probable distance estimate will be an underestimate. And even if we try to make an average of many parallaxes, uh, we will get an overestimated distance value. To tackle this, we need to build a Bayesian framework where the question is, what is the probability of finding a star at a distance r given a parallax pi? Here, the important uh, part is this row, which ca uh, can be considered our Bayesian prior. It represents the distribution of, of our stellar uh, population. We have modeled it assuming two components, one for the disk and another for the halo that should address the, the contribution of massive runaway stars, by the way. Um, one thing we have shown is that this model is pretty insensitive to reasonable changes in, the, in its parameters. And thus, we can consider this to be a quite uh, robust prior. Uh, so our uncertainties now for the ALS3 have reached the values of the table. As you can see, uh, we now have less than 10% in relative uncertainty for distances even beyond three kiloparsecs away. And we reach fairly good approximations even at five kiloparsecs. And the last row is an interesting one uh, in the table, shows the theoretical limit given by the 10.3 micro arc second systematics in the EDR3 parallaxes if we were able to reduce the random uncertainties somehow, right? Uh, as you can see, this is not extremely far from, uh, from the total uncertainty. So this is a good indication that the distances are, are quite uh, accurate. Another way to understand the quality of these distances uh, is to compare it with studies for more general populations. On the left, you can see the discrepancy between baylor jones estimates and ours. Uh, and you can see that it is always below the 3% difference, even after a few kiloparsecs of distance. We can also make a very neat HR diagram with a new ALS uh, with EDR3 data. We divide the diagram in different regions using the zero main sequence uh, and extinction tracks corresponding to 10 and 20,000 Kelvin stars. And as we see there, um, we have around 100 high gravity objects below the suns, uh, white dwarfs, uh, hot soft dwarfs, and, and, and others that slip through the original ALS. And there's also around 300 low mass stars that should have never been there in the first place, but uh, we include them. But the important thing is that after cleaning the sample, we are left with 15,000 massive stars plus 1.7 thousand probable cases. In the upper left, by the way, you can clearly see the desert in the very massive stars close to the sands uh, that Gonzalo Olgado talked about yesterday, uh, without considering the contribution of extinction in our case, obviously. Finally, there are seven highly luminous extragalactic stars that are also uh, were also sleeping inside the original ALS. They are marked as seven small white dots in the upper left part of the diagram. Two minutes. Okay, uh, yeah, we don't have enough time for this slide, but thanks to the new ALS, we, we saw that some extinction estimates are highly unreliable and in some cases show even in physical situations. And finally, here you have the map of our stellar district, the most accurate one available by now with the uh, EDR3 data for all the stars. At the center, you have um, the sun, and to the right, I've marked with uh, a red star, the galactic center. 
The spoil arm structure can be seen with the with a local Orion, Orion arm uh, in blue, the Corena Sagittarius arm in purple, and the Perseus in red. If we, if, if we make um, a zoom uh, over a few kiloparsecs around the solar system, this is the, the map with EDR3 data, right? And we can compare it with a map with DR2 data uh, of just two months ago. The decrease in the distance and uncertainties can be perceived clearly as the red dispersion of stellar associations shrinks. Uh, these are these uh, finger-like structures that go radially from the sun, right? Let me highlight uh, another time the spiral arms uh, to point out this particular sequence of OB associations that seem to indicate a branching of the Orion arm towards the Perseus arm. This interarm bridge of recent star formation is what we now call the Cepheus spore. The structure was actually first suggested by Morgan itself in the 50s and later by Roberta Humphreys in 1970. But there has been a 50 year silence in the community about this structure. We now finally have uh, been able to recover it with the ALS3. We have also shown that this, over, this is not just a mere random over, over density in the stellar distribution. There's a kinematical analysis that shows the entire city spore has a consistent motion towards the, the four galactic quadrant in, in this case. But the most remarkable feature of this structure is that when we overlay a Gaussian kernel density map of the average height over the mid galactic plane, we can clearly see that the CPU spore is consistently above that plane by about uh, 100 parsecs. We think this is related to the cosmographic feature discovered by the Alves team last year called the, the, right, the Red Clive Wave, which now we show to be a part of the more complicated structure as to the spatial oscillation across the disk. The so-called corrugations are also seen in other disk galaxies, but we are now having the first glimpses of this in our own Milky Way. In general, it is believed that these oscillations are the telltale of galactic merging events. So let me finish with the future. We are now adding even more stars and expecting to send a new LS3 by the summer. We are starting and following some spectroscopic surveys in the north and in the south to corroborate or reject even more OB stars. We are on our way to a possible breakthrough in the number of galactic OB stars, uh, thanks to what can be detected with uh, DR2, uh, DR2 sorry, and EDR3 photometry uh, by combining and exploiting uh, this to create a new photometric system. This is in preparation, by the way, by Weiler and Jesus, and I will use this uh, coupled with some machine learning algorithms towards the creation of the ALS4. We will also improve our models for stellar distribution, make even more accurate distance estimates, and we are going to add layers to galactic cartography by including via Frank Oster groups and OBI associations from right. We also expect to start a study about the kinematics of the spiral arms and begin a search for new massive runaways. So I leave you with, the, uh, with a more useful visualization of our data. We have overimposed a 3D stellar map on top of a reasonable artistic depiction of the Milky Way. You can see the structures I've been talking about. Uh, there's a flyby through some important associations. And <laughs> to be completely honest, uh, I was able to render this animation with the data just one hour ago. So it really is also my, my first time seeing this. And if you have any questions, I will be here and in the discussion session. Okay, thanks.